It's interesting to note, uh, if you take a look at macromolecular structures, you know, anything larger than about 200 kilodaltons, uh, nearly one-third of all the, the structures uh, from cryo-EM and X-ray crystallography report resolutions uh, less than uh, three angstroms. Uh, so uh, these large density maps at this type of resolu resolution are very complex. Uh, you can begin to see some features. The, the definition between the, the subunits in these large assemblies uh, is often uh, visible, but some of the, the smaller interfaces uh, between uh, the individual proteins get, get obscured. So um, in this next slide, what I've done is I've just taken um, a density map, uh, there are three different density maps, uh, two from cryo-EM and one from X-ray crystallography at different resolutions. This is kind of give you an idea about the features that we can see at the different resolutions and kind of give you an idea of what uh, the, the features are we're going to be looking at um, interpreting with, using Gorgon. Um, so in the, the panel, uh, this first panel, uh, this is a 3.4 angstrom structure of the Brom mosaic virus, uh, solved by X-ray crystallography a few years ago. And you can see uh, you get some very nice definition uh, of some strands in a beta sheet. You get uh, some uh, side chain density. And the overall uh, appearance of the map is fairly noise-free, and it makes for a relatively unambiguous trace. If you look at slightly low resolution structures, uh, which can now be typically uh, obtained using uh, cryo-EM, the, re the, the features that we see are quite a bit different than what we'd expect of just the slightly higher resolution structures. At kind of this four angstrom resolution range, uh, we can begin to see some separation of the beta sheets, but they're not unambiguously separated. Uh, the chain trace is uh, more or less evident uh, uh, in a lot of places, but there, again, there's a lot of ambiguity and uh, there's some, um, uh, the density isn't fully resolved in, in all locations. Um, even at uh, four and a half, five angstrom resolution, uh, we begin to lose our definition of beta sheets. We can still see uh, kind of the, the pitch of the alpha helix, but the, uh, the tracing of the, the overall backbone of the protein becomes very difficult. And if you see in this bottom panel, uh, you can see a nice uh, loop that's well defined. Uh, but this big kind of mess uh, over here on the left is actually a beta sheet where the, the strands haven't been fully fully separated. So uh, over the, the course of the, the last couple of years, we've developed a, a variety of different software to help us interpret these, uh, uh, these structures and maximize the information that we can get out of them. Um, and this is just kind of a... a time course showing the different software we developed, but the, the software that's colored here kind of in the, the darker black um, is stuff that we've developed more recently and uh, the stuff that you'll find actually as part of uh, Gorgon or related to our, our Gorgon software developments. Uh, and I'll go through these a, a little bit, but basically um, uh, our Gorgon utility is based around a de novo modeling protocol we developed uh, back in about 2007-2008. Uh, initially, this was all kind of done ad hoc, where we, we took our, our density map, we identified the individual uh, proteins, segmented them out, uh, and so that's what you see over here, kind of in this middle section. We then used a tool called SSE Hunter, which we developed in about 2006, 2007, which actually identifies the alpha helices and beta sheets. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I, I discuss Gorgon a little bit. Uh, but essentially, we, we can annotate in the density map uh, where we believe the, the locations of alpha helices and beta sheets are. So the, the beta sheets are shown kind of in these uh, cyan flames and the, the alpha helices are shown in these uh, green uh, cylinders. Um, that gives us a good spatial uh, localization of our secondary structure elements, but gives us uh, no information about the actual sequence associated uh, with, with those secondary structure elements. So, Naively, what we tried back in 2007 was that we took our, our secondary structure element, uh, our, our sequence, predicted the secondary structure uh, of our sequence, and looked to see if we could find a match of our, our, uh, our sequence elements to our structure elements. So we did this by essentially just trying to take uh, all our helices, which are shown here in green, and see if we could find a helix of approximate size uh, within our density map. Well, as you can imagine, you know, even with the protein as small as you know eight or nine helices, uh, combinatorially trying to uh, maximize or figure out which permutations of helices fit the uh, fit the observed helices in the sequence 
was very difficult. One of the things that we did have um, as part of our SSC Hunter tools was the, de the development of this density skeleton. And the density skeleton basically gave us a lot of topological information on which secondary structure elements were connected uh, to each other. And using this, we basically uh, could build a, by hand a model uh, for how we believed our, our structure, uh, the, the fold of our structure and how our secondary structure elements were connected. Um, so once we have that kind of information, that level of information, we could develop this uh, basic chain trace and then kind of go through the density, look at the features, um, you know, find out where we had alpha helices and beta sheets and try and uh, improve the structure uh, for, uh, for geometry, look where we may have some uh, large bulky side chains where we might be able to anchor the trace. And, um, you know, we built one subunit and then we build the entire asymmetric unit in case of this virus and iterate back and forth uh, through the C-alpha model building and refinement routines until we developed our, our final model. Again, this was all done by hand, uh, and at this point, uh, we were using basically just a, a generic uh, C-alpha trace to, to describe the, the fold of the protein. Well, fast forward a few years, and we developed a much more complicated scheme uh, where, we, uh, where we would not only build just a C-alpha model, but we could build an entire all-atom model. And uh, this used the same basic concept as before, kind of a registration with secondary structure elements, but it also allowed us to incorporate uh, some uh, newer routines for uh, refinement of our structure. Uh, and so as, as things evolved, we began to develop uh, kind of a, this, this large protocol, but it required uh, a very large number of different uh, utilities. So uh, as you can imagine, all these different utilities have uh, various uh, Parameters and uh, various file formats, and so you know this became a you know this was a very ad hoc uh, approach uh, in both the the uh, de novo modeling and the the all atom model building. So you can imagine this was very difficult to to maintain just the the data, uh, let alone uh, do the interpretation. So in terms of software, we were using Eman and Eman two to kind of do density map uh, manipulations. We used Amira, Viso, Chimera to do kind of our visualization and segmentation of the subunits. Uh, we used Coot to do some uh, manual uh, model building and editing. Uh, we used Phoenix, Rosetta, Modeler, depending on the different uh, constraints that our density map had and the different constraints we had with uh, homology models, we could use those different packages to either re uh, refine the models or improve the models. So anyway, uh, you know, the, the, as the number of near-atomic resolution structures, these medium-resolution structures, uh, grew, it became more and more difficult to manage one of these projects. Uh, and so we started developing uh, our own utility called Gorgon. Uh, Gorgon basically took that original de novo model modeling protocol um, and uh, streamlined it into a single software package that was capable of, of doing... Uh, the visualization of the density map, uh, the model, as well as all the interpretations uh, from identifying secondary structure elements to tracing the, the uh, backbone uh, for an individual protein. So uh, our first version uh, of Gorgon was released in 2008, and it contained the, kind of just the very basic routines. Uh, and over the last uh, six or seven years, we've been uh, gradually improving it. Uh, our current production release is version 2.1 and incorporates a number of uh, de novo modeling tools uh, as well as some uh, new uh, new tools for uh, fitting structures, uh, both as rigid bodies and flexibly fitting, uh, as well as some improved algorithms for uh, for doing our uh, SSC uh, correspondence searches. Um, just kind of some of the real basic parts about Gorgon, we support a variety of different platforms. Uh, a primary uh, distribution is uh, through Windows and uh, Mac OS X. Uh, we do support uh, Linux, 32-bit uh, and 64-bit versions of Linux as well. Uh, if you visit our, our Gorgon website, uh, which is gorgon.westall.edu, I should mention this Gorgon project uh, was a collaboration with Tao Ju, who's at Washington University in uh, St. Louis. Uh, if you visit our Gorgon webpage, you'll find a number of online videos and tutorials uh, as well as uh, any announcements for upcoming uh, workshops uh, or training. Okay, so uh, with that, now what exactly does Gorgon do? Um, as I mentioned, it takes basically our entire D 
de novo modeling pipeline uh, and, and streamlines, streamlines it into one single software interface. Um, and we have a number of very important key features uh, that were uh, that were actually improved upon in, in Gorgon. Of course, uh, Gorgon does our density map and model uh, visualization. We support a number of, of file formats for density maps, uh, coordinate data, uh, as well as geometric data like VRML. Uh, one of the, the things that was unique to, to our uh, de novo modeling uh, process was our density skeletonization routines. Uh, we now have both automatic uh, density skeletonization as well as interactive density skeletonization routines within Gorgon that allow you to essentially uh, define the connectivity between our secondary structure elements. SSE Hunter, which was originally developed for EMAN, is now an integral part of Gorgon. Uh, so we have the, the latest and greatest version of SSE Hunter that's currently available in Gorgon, and it supports uh, both uh, this assisted uh, secondary structure element building as well as a fully automated uh, building. Uh, again, we have our SSE correspondence routines, which use our identified secondary structure elements basically as landmarks to do our, our model building. Uh, we have a number of different uh, model building, actual uh, atom placement routines, uh, a, as well as uh, some rigid body and flexible fitting routines. Uh, I should mention, though, the flexible fitting routines are not available in the production release. Uh, those are part of our, uh, our development version, uh, and hopefully within the next few weeks we'll have a, a new uh, production version that incorporates all of our, our latest changes. Um, so probably the first thing that I should mention is exactly how Gorgon accomplishes secondary structure element identification. Uh, again, we're using basically uh, a method that was published in 2007 uh, uh, that was originally part of our EMAN software called SSC Hunter. Uh, SSC Hunter uses a kind of a, a guided approach to identify alpha helices and beta sheets uh, uh, simultaneously. Uh, and it's relatively accurate. We can detect most helices greater than two turns and most uh, beta sheets greater than three strands in this kind of uh, four to ten angstrom resolution range uh, uh, cryo density maps. So real quickly, our, our SSC Hunter methodology is based on uh, essentially a combination of three separate scores uh, that help define uh, helices beta sh and beta sheets. The first uh, scoring routine is basically using this uh, uh, cross-correlation with the prototypical helix. Uh, our second routine uses the density skeletonization to identify planes uh, and lines at a density map where the planes uh, are defined as our beta sheets. And then we use some local geometry scores uh, to essentially help uh, interpret the ambiguous regions. Uh, and we take these three different routines, to, uh, each have an individual score, we develop a composite score, uh, which then we can use to, to um, uh, score a density map and annotate the structure. So here's just a, a, a seven angstrom resolution density map. Uh, this is the, the uh, correlation with the prototypical helix. The yellow represents regions that we might expect to see alpha helices. Uh, here's our density uh, skeleton. You can see uh, we've got uh, kind of two big planes up here in the top of the density that probably represent beta sheets. Uh, we can map those along with our, our geometry scores uh, to a set of discrete points in the density map that we represent as these uh, pseudoatoms, uh, where the pseudoatoms are scored on a gradient uh, from uh, dark blue to dark red, where blue represents beta sheet and red re represents alpha helices. And then you can either interactively or automatically uh, group these pseudoatoms to identify uh, secondary structure elements. So uh, one of the things I showed during the, uh, the de novo modeling process and uh, the uh, secondary structure element identification was this density skeleton. Um, the density skeleton is very important uh, in both processes, um, and this is something that Tao Ju and I developed uh, a number of years back that was unique to kind of our, our medium resolution density maps. Um, through a series of iterative pruning and thinning algorithms, we tried to define uh, plate-like features and line-like features uh, in our density map. Uh, and this allowed two things. It allowed feature preserving. So we knew our, our beta sheets should look like these planes, uh, and our helices and loops should just be represented as single curves. Uh, but our skeleton would also preserve the topology of our density map. So we weren't going to introduce any uh, 
spurious connections. We weren't going to break any connections within the density map. Basically, we were looking at kind of the, the minimal representation of the, the features of the density map and how they were connected. And this information uh, allowed us, essentially, to uh, transform our, our sequence uh, prediction and our sec uh, secondary structure element identification uh, into our full model building protocol. And in Gorgon, uh, our SSE correspondent uh, uses a, a graph matching approach. Uh, it use, uh, uses a A star graph matching approach that allows a, a kind of an inexact match. So if we're missing a helix or we're missing a, a sheet in either the density or in the sequence, uh, we can accommodate uh, accommodate that. But basically, we're using the lengths of the helices and the uh, length of the density skeleton uh, to define a, a graph uh, that we can match with our, our primary sequence graph. Uh, and again, uh, Gorgon is meant to be kind of an interactive environment, so we have both uh, user-defined constraints as well as kind of some um, automatic uh, tools to help define a, a potential correspondence or a path through our density map. Um, and as you'll see in a, a demo, uh, which will happen just in a, a few minutes, uh, it's very quick to actually build a, a model with Gorgon and very easy to use. Um, and currently, the... the uh, uh, Gorgon and the, the graph matching approach, uh, we can handle uh, up to about 50 or 60 uh, alpha helices in a very, uh, or secondary structure elements in a very uh, reasonable amount of time. Okay, so the other kind of unique thing in Gorgon is actually how we accomplish model building. Uh, because we're at lower resolution and we don't have a lot of uh, anchor points within our, our density map to kind of constrain, uh, you know, the actual sequence assignment uh, to our, our density map, we actually use uh, our density skeleton to help uh, essentially provide us uh, with a path through our density map uh, uh, that's based on our SSE correspondence. And so we've developed a number of tools uh, to help us trace, uh, trace that path uh, that rely on our, both our, our correspondence and our, our density skeleton. And again, I'll show you some of these. Uh, uh, some of them are very similar to X-ray crystallography. Others are, are fairly unique to our model building situation and, and that actually allow you to uh, sketch out a path uh, within your density map. Okay, so this is a, a model that I built uh, a few years back of the rotavirus uh, VP6 uh, protein. This was a, about a four-angstrom structure from cryo-EM. Um, and I've just shown a, a couple zoomed-in views to show you kind of the, the level of detail that we can get. Uh, the uh, uh, blue to red colored structure uh, actually is, is our model and represents the RMSD uh, relative to the known structure. Regions where we have a high uh, RMSD are colored red, low RMSD are blue. Uh, and you can see kind of the, the, the basic uh, uh, differences between our model and the, the real structure. Uh, one of the, the big dependents of our, our Gorgon utilities are the reliability of the secondary structure elements, uh, both from the secondary structure uh, identification in the density map as well as uh, prediction in the sequence. If you have a different, you know, if your secondary structure elements are in the sequence are predicted uh, off by a, you know an amino acid or two that can cause a shift in the correspondence and result in some of the errors. And that's actually what you see down this bottom panel. Uh, where our beta sheets were uh, shifted by about uh, five amino acids uh, because of the, the uh, prediction, the secondary structure prediction of the primary sequence. Okay, so what do you need for to, to use Go Gorgon? Well, obviously you need to d download the Gorgon executable. The uh, Gorgon executable does not require any other uh, dependencies. It's a, a standalone program. Uh, in terms of inputs, what you need is a segment density map. It can be uh, any type of density map. We supr uh, support a variety of different formats. The CCP4 format, uh, the MRC format are probably our two most standard that, uh, and work the best with, uh, with Gorgon. And then, of course, you need your, your sequence to your protein. So uh, during Gorgon, you'll calculate uh, the model building process in Gorgon. Uh, you'll calculate the secondary structure elements in the density map. Uh, you'll, you can use our uh, uh, essentially a meta prediction tool to predict the secondary structure uh, based on your, your primary sequence, and, and you'll calculate a, a density skeleton. And in terms of outputs, uh, 
what you'll see is uh, you'll get a, a VRML representation of your secondary structure elements. Again, those are those green cylinders and the, the cyan planes. Uh, you'll generate a density skeleton as well as then a, a C alpha backbone trace if you go all the way through the model building procedure. Uh, we have uh, utilities for saving your session, so you don't have to do this all in one sitting. You can come back uh, and load up uh, the intermediate uh, process. Uh, but I should mention that uh, the actual Gorgon model building is very quick to, to develop an initial model. Uh, and even for a larger model like Grow EL, which is uh, uh, 500 plus amino acids, it can only take, it, it, an experienced user, it might only take uh, 48 hours, four to eight hours to, to build a complete model. Um, some limitations with Gorgon. Uh, right now, in the current version of Gorgon, we support only a kind of a single protein model. Uh, we hope in a, a coming version of uh, Gorgon that we'll actually be able to support uh, multiple protein models at one time. So rather than building one protein from your assembly at a time, you'll actually be able to build an entire assembly just uh, protein by protein. Uh, we have plans to take into account uh, symmetry uh, as well, as well as some um, uh, new validation tools uh, that will help prevent clashes and, and uh, improve uh, model building. Um, Typically, Gorgon is best suited for uh, about three to seven angstrom resolution density maps. Uh, not all density maps are created equal, so uh, some three angstrom density maps uh, may work spectacularly. Others may not work very well at all. Um, obviously, this is, a, this is something related to the actual image processing and data collection rather than the, the model interpretation. Uh, you also have to have detectable secondary structure elements. Uh, that is a requirement for the de novo modeling process. Uh, and as of right now, we have very limited, I shouldn't say no validation of results, we have very limited uh, validation. We, do, uh, we basically check for uh, some very crude uh, geometry conditions, uh, such as bond length. All right, so with that, um, let's see if we can get a quick demo of Gorgon going. So what I have here is just a small segmented uh, piece of uh, our grow EL density map at about 4.2 angstroms resolution. Um, this is just meant for demo purposes, and actually you can download the, the same data set uh, from our Gorgon website. So um, what I did was I essentially just loaded up a, a simple volume uh, real quick. Uh, if we were going to do this uh, uh, not in real time, and not as part of a kind of a, a web uh, seminar, uh, I'd actually go ahead and show you how we uh, actually do our skeletonization. Uh, but unfortunately, that, takes, that can take two or three minutes to run. But what I will show you is our uh, SSA correspondence routine. And uh, I've, I've got some uh, pre-canned uh, data that we can use. So uh, here's our, this is our uh, density skeleton. Uh, within our density map, uh, our uh, secondary structure prediction, our sequence, and secondary structure prediction are, are loaded up here. And our uh, helices uh, are represented here as uh, VRML models, uh, and you should be able to see them now. Uh, just real quickly, um, our, VR, our VRML models uh, internally are represented uh, as a, a set of uh, secondary structure elements uh, that have a, a define uh, that are defined this way, uh, it's basically uh, a 3D coordinate and uh, for the start and stop points, uh, as well as a uh, length of number of amino acids. Uh, our secondary structure element prediction is very simple as well. Uh, it's basically the sequence uh, as well as a uh, a prediction uh, corresponding to the, the sequence of our, our uh, entrance of structure. Okay, so once we have all this loaded, uh, we can just hit the OK button, and you can see within a few seconds, we actually have a, a correspondence. If you look over here in the results window, it will show you um, that we matched uh, helix 0 from the, the secondary structure elements with helix 1 from our, our SSE Hunter determined uh, helices on the density map. Uh, and you can click through and you can look at uh, the different correspondences for the different helices and kind of get, get an idea of uh, how the uh, 
graph matching routine, it uh, localized the, the sequence elements to the structure. So the next part that we'll, we'll do is to actually build a model. Uh, and so under the action C alpha tab, uh, we have this semi-automatic atom placement routine uh, where we can, uh, we can build our models. And so again, this is a, a very, very easy to do. Uh, we have our interactive interface right here. Uh, the uh, primary uh, sequence and the secondary structure elements are shown uh, in this graphical representation on top, uh, and this uh, view down here uh, in the middle. Uh, our actual model building utilities are shown down here at the bottom. So essentially what you need to do to build a model is um, to identify a helix or a, a, any secondary structure element you're going to start at. In this case, um, I'm going to click on the secondary structure element that belongs to the, this first alpha helix. So uh, once I have that information, you can see that in our helix element editor tab, um, it's defined residues 53 and 59 through 59 as belonging to this helix. So the, the set of residues up here. Uh, what we can do is we can simply hit the accept button and that will uh, create a prototypical alpha helix. Um, we can do that as well for uh, all the other helices. Uh, one thing I, I will show you real quick is that we have this uh, uh, um, secondary structure element uh, fit selected helix so when you build the helix as a VRML model, it essentially builds it as a rigid body, and it can sometimes uh, come out of register with the density. Uh, you can use this fit helix to essentially improve the, the fit to the density. Uh, so once you have that information or that localization, you can go back over, go to your, your next helix. Uh, you can build the, the helix again. Uh, you can see the helix ends up being a little bit too long for the density map. So I can come back over here, select the, the helix, and then just uh, with the mouse, I can move the uh, I can move the position of the helix uh, to better fit the density. I can delete atoms. I can add atoms to this helix. Uh, but for now, we'll, we'll just keep it uh, fairly simple. Uh, here, I'm going to turn off the uh, uh, the alpha helices and the beta sheets. Uh, real quick, uh, just to give you an idea that we actually built the coordinates, and I'll also turn off uh, the density skeleton uh, for now. And basically what you're seeing right now are just the two helices we built and the potential path between uh, the, those two helices. So if we go back over to our uh, C-alpha uh, model building uh, utilities, uh, uh, we can Let's see, let's get this helix. Uh, we can move this helix into the density a little bit better, uh, just like that. And we can start uh, building our, our helix, uh, or building the loop between the helix using uh, our atomic editor. Uh, basically, this is kind of like what you'd find in uh, Coot or other extra crystallographic uh, uh, packages. It allows you to select an atom, and then it will try to identify uh, the the possible position for uh, uh, for that for the next atom or the previous atom, just depending on uh, if you choose to go forward or, or backwards. Uh, we have a C alpha distance a uh, editor here, so we can actually change kind of the, the interval that we want to look for our next uh, next point. In this case, uh, it's, we'll we'll give it a little bit more. Uh, and then we can cycle through uh, which atoms we want. You can see the cyan, cyan atom is uh, the currently selected atom that will place uh, residue uh, 60. And then we can go through. Let's take this back down. Um, and we can, uh, we essentially can just build our, our model from there. And so we, um, oops, uh, and there's an undo feature. Uh, so if you go the wrong direction, uh, you can just simply undo, um, and this will allow us to accept, and you can essentially follow the, uh, your progress. You can see we've got about three more residues to place, uh, so I can look at 
which possible uh, C alpha atoms I want to place. And there we go. We, we've uh, just built the loop that connects two secondary structure elements. Um, one of the things that we can also do in Gorgon, uh, because we don't have a lot of uh, high resolution features and we're really just building kind of a C alpha trace, we have this button right here called mock sidechains that essentially allows you to kind of visualize you know, uh, the, the approximate size uh, of the, the residue you're building. So you know, if you know you're, you've got kind of a, a blobby density, you know that might be you know, a, a, an aromatic residue. Or if you've got a, a gap in your density map, that might be you know, a, a glycine or an alanine. So it's a, it's a quick way of kind of visualizing where you're at and what you're seeing. Okay, so that was the, the Gorgon tutorial, uh, uh, real quick. I want to just, uh, I've got just a few quick slides left, uh, and I want to talk about a new utility that's not part of Gorgon yet, but again, uh, hopefully in this next version of, of Gorgon that's coming out uh, shortly, we'll have a, a new uh, model building utility to, to augment Gorgon's current modeling capabilities. Um, so. As I mentioned, the, the Gorgon modeling process is all based around the identification of secondary structure elements within the sequence and the density map and the ability to find a correspondence. Well, what if we have kind of these slightly higher resolution structures? Um, can we find a path through the density where we don't need to use explicit secondary structure element definitions? We don't use any sequence derived information, so no structural templates. Um, no uh, prediction uh, of uh, interactions or interfaces, uh, and can we do this kind of in a mostly automated fashion? Well, it turns out um, the problem is actually pretty similar to a traveling salesman problem. So, um, essentially, a traveling salesman problem calculates an optimal route between a set of cities, um, and it minimizes the distance traveled, uh, and it makes sure that each city is only visited once. Um, and of course, this, this problem has uh, been studied quite a bit in computer science, uh, and there are both uh, exact and heuristic solvers uh, that work very well for very, very large sets of, of problems. So what we did was we essentially reposed the, the traveling salesman problem as a protein folding problem. So if we could take our density map and populate it with uh, uh, C-alpha atoms, so the actual, like, uh, C alpha atoms that you might find on a backbone, could you find, using a traveling salesman problem could, uh, uh, approach, could you find the optimal trace? And it turns out what we have to do is rather than calculating a minimal distance, we calculated minimal error. Because we essentially know what the distance between C alpha atoms should be. should be about 3.8 angstroms. So if we just assume that our C, uh, C alpha atoms in our, our protein fold are, are distributed as such, we should be able to find an optimal trace through a density map uh, using the traveling salesman uh, problem and minimizing the error rather than a total distance. And what we end up with uh, is a routine called path walking. And we've uh, tested path walking on a number of different structures. Uh, the method was published uh, uh, last year, actually 2012, um, and it works very well on uh, all sorts of data from uh, you know, three, three and a half angstrom resolution uh, cryonium density maps. Uh, to five angstrom X-ray density maps, uh, as well as some even lower resolution uh, uh, cryonium density maps. And so this is just a gallery uh, of some of the structures we've tried it on. Okay, so I think that brings uh, kind of to a close uh, the utilities uh, that I wanted to talk about, and uh, be happy to answer some questions uh, as soon as I just mentioned some uh, of the people who collaborated on this project. Uh, the Gorgon project uh, was a project developed. Uh, between myself and uh, Tao Ju, who's at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, there's been a number of developers, uh, both at, here at Baylor College of Medicine and at Washington University at St. Louis, who've worked on this in uh, very different ways. Uh, for your reference, you can go to the Gorgon uh, Project webpage, uh, gorgon.w uh, at worcester.edu. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, user guides, video demos. Uh, as well as uh, the downloads for all the, the different versions of our software. Uh, we have a bug reporting uh, process uh, as well, so if you find a bug, which happens more often than we would like, uh, you can report it to us directly. 
Uh, additionally, we have a number of papers where you can read about the, the methods more specifically uh, or kind of get an overview of both of uh, the Gorgon based de novo modeling approach as well as the, the Pathwater mo uh, modeling approach. Uh, and with that, uh, I guess I'll end right here and uh, I can take some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. We've got a couple of questions here. Uh, the first is from uh, Xiaofeng Li, who is asking, the secondary structure prediction in Gorgon is, is built in, and if it's not, do you have a recommended method, a uh, recommended secondary structure prediction? Uh, yeah, so we don't use any uh, secondary structure, or we don't, we didn't develop our own secondary structure prediction method for the sequ sequence-based uh, predictions. Um, Generally speaking, uh, I'll actually create a meta prediction uh, using a couple different servers. I think my favorite uh, prediction server, not to offend anybody if anybody's listening, is, is JPRED right now. Uh, I seem to be getting the most reliable results, uh, at least on the, the structures I've been working with. Okay, great. Uh, second question is uh, for modeling homodimers. Can you model homodimers? Are there any special considerations for homodimers? Uh, no, and in fact, uh, the uh, one example I showed with rotavirus VP6 is actually a homo trimer. I just happened to sub, uh, segment one subunit out. Um, currently, we don't support any symmetry elements. Again, I, it's a reoccurring thing. These are uh, these are uh, different pieces that we're planning to add on in future versions of Gorgon uh, as support for not just dimers but trimers, all sorts of different symmetry classes. So. Uh, you can build a model in one part of the density and hope, hopefully propagate uh, to the, the corresponding position. Great. So uh, with that, I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Uh, Gorgon is in the SP Grid Programs collection, so you can fire up a terminal and type Gorgon at the prompt, and you'll uh, be ready to get started.